um, Dr. Lee Gross, you already heard about his EMR story. Um, he's one of these green shoots that Mr. Goldhill was talking about, who that is coming up with solutions. It's part of the, the movement where we're going to see uh, people be, doctors be able to get really back into the business of taking care of patients as their primary, um, as their primary business, as the primary uh, value that you're off offering to people is you yourself, your knowledge, you, um, your skills as a physician, and your interaction with those vulnerable when they're sick, um, curious when they're when they're healthy and want to not get sick, uh, individuals with with incredible stories that, let me tell you, as a doctor, you want the time to be able to hear those stories. And the stories that you get to hear because you have a kind of a practice that is set up that your patients are the full focus of it, it's amazing the number of heroes that you will meet and you will get to see the intimate aspects of lives that no other profession gets to see, unless maybe it's a minister or someone in, in that field. Um, so anyway, this is a model that's really exciting. It's a way that we can offer, continue to offer quality and in innovation. And you're talking to one of the pioneers, you're getting to listen to one of the pioneers in this movement. And I think you're really going to enjoy Dr. Gross. So I'm tasked with the uh, challenge to keep you guys awake <laughs> for quite a long day. So uh, I appreciate those uh, that have managed to survive this long. And so my name is Lee Gross. I'm a primary care doctor in the practice, uh, the primary practice of medicine since 2002. Uh, originally from Cleveland, Ohio, did my undergraduate training at Ohio State, or undergraduate at Ohio State University Med School, Case Western Reserve University. Spent three years doing clinical research with the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in their uh, interventional cardiology cath lab. Uh, and uh, when I did my residency at the Case Western Reserve University, I've been practicing in Southwest Florida uh, ever since. Uh, I should probably point out this is probably the first time I've been invited to a presentation for you since we did that one in, uh, at Rowan. Anyone from Rowan? Yes, oh, you were here. So, and you've probably even heard the story before. Uh, I was the first speaker at, at the, the conference in Rowan for the American Medical Student Association. Uh, and if you know about uh, AMSA, AMSA pulled, out, pulled away from the American Medical Association because they thought it was too conservative for them. Uh, and I went to get up on stage and uh, just in front of me the president of the university gets up and starts giving this long speech about what a wonderful time it is for these students to be going into medicine with all the computers and care teams and basically all the supportive stuff and it was just the worst possible introduction you could have uh, for somebody that's going to give a, a talk on free market uh, health care reform. Um, but we managed to pull it off and it was great. Uh, so I invited me back and I'm doing another talk with them in, uh, in April. So, So Epiphany Health is a pretty strange name for a, for a healthcare company. Um, and basically, we're just like every other primary care doctor, just got very frustrated with the practice of medicine. Uh, we would get to the end of the day, and after filling out, clicking all the boxes and filling out the forms and doing prior authorizations and step edits, uh, and all this stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with patient care, we just get very frustrated at the end of the day, say, there's got to be a better way to do this. We can't survive like this. We can't just go for an entire career uh, beating our heads against the door and trying to make this make this thing work. One day one of my colleagues got a phone call from a local employer of the heating and air conditioning business and he said, you know, I have 10 employees and all 10 of my employees see you as their doctor. Why can't I just pay you directly to take care of my employees? Mm -hmm. And what I'll do is I'll switch them all to a high deductible health plan and even if I pay their deductibles, I'm still going to come out ahead at the end of the, at the, end of the month. My friend called me up and said, you know, what do you think about this? I said, you know, well, you know, primary care is cheap. I mean, all we do is sell brain time. We're not selling a ten thousand dollar hip or a hundred thousand dollar pacemaker, so we shouldn't have to charge a whole lot to do this sort of thing and keep things going. Uh, 
our equipment consists of paper and a little plastic ear speculum, nothing too, too exotic that we should have to run the cost. Our drugs that we use in the office are pretty cheap, so yeah, I think we probably could do this, but we need some affordable labs, we need some, some affordable imaging, uh, we need some physical therapy, just some really basic stuff to, to be able to provide uh, all the necessary things we need to do as primary care doctors. So it's just like a light one off saying, you know, this is really simple. I mean, this is a very simple model. We can simplify it. Everybody else out of the room. So uh, because everything else is what seems to drive the cost stuff outside of our office, but inside the office, things were pretty reasonably priced. So what we did was we set up uh, over time what was ultimately becoming what we call direct primary care. It's a membership-based monthly membership program to our office. We charge a flat monthly fee, and after that flat monthly fee, we don't charge a penny for anything that we do in our office. We don't charge for procedures, we don't charge for injections, uh, we don't have to charge co-pays, we don't charge deductibles. Just like people join a uh, health club, you don't pay to use the sauna, you don't pay to use the equipment, you just pay your monthly fee. And again, what we did was we wrapped around us uh, the things that we would need to do. So we reached out to the local independent physical therapy groups, we reached out to the local imaging centers, the, the uh, local labs, uh, the local pharmacies, the local specialists, specialists, the local ambulatory surgery centers, and said, you know, if we're going to send you a, a patient that is going to be a self-paying patient, they agree to pay you at the time of service, what can you sell your service for? Uh, and put it, in, put it on paper. We only ask that you, you sign an agreement with us and tell us if you're going to change your prices because we want total price transparency in everything that we do. So we've been talking about this uh, much of the morning into the afternoon about, you know, about what happens in the free market. And when you go into some circles, they say, well, we tried the free market healthcare system and it didn't work. Well, there's nothing about the system that we have in place or had in place that was free market. We certainly had competition in the marketplace, but uh, competition with price fixing and, and uh, federal oversight is not how the free market works. So in where I trained, we had Cleveland Clinic and University Hospital of Cleveland right next door to each other. And the competition was fierce. They would take multiple city blocks and they would, they would to see who could build buildings faster uh, and go higher. And they were competing to put in pacemakers. And you know, so uh, although they're fighting to put in a lot of pacemakers, they're not actually doing anything to bring down the cost of pacemakers. They're just doing a lot of very expensive stuff uh, and, a, and a lot of volume of it. Yeah, so in the true free market, you get a black, uh, a 32-inch uh, LCD screen that comes to the market $725. You start getting some competition. You start making things cheaper. You start uh, finding better ways and cheaper ways to manufacture things, and before you know it, it's a $200 Black Friday special at Walmart. But in healthcare, this is what competition has done in the healthcare market. Uh, you can see uh, the costs continue to rise. Uh, it's a quite a, quite a different situation, but we can actually see similar differences like this even within the healthcare system itself. So if you look at a ophthalmologist that puts in cataracts, So why is insurance, health insurance, so expensive? Because it, it's not insurance. And in fact, uh, in talking with our, with our insurance regulator in the state of Florida, one of the things he likes to do is he goes up to places and he said, what is one thing that, that one uh, product that I regulate that's not actually insurance? And his answer is health insurance. It is not health insurance. It is prepaid, prepaid, med prepaid medical plan. So you don't use your health or your, your car insurance to buy gasoline, to change the oil, to put on new tires. You don't use your homeowner's insurance to mow the lawn, to replace burnt out light bulbs. But we're using, we're using our health insurance to pay for primary care, preventive services, diabetes management, hypertension management. These are all very affordable things that should not be used uh, an insurance charge to, to pull up to pay for these routine expenses. They should be affordable for everybody and the prices should be open to it. One of the interesting things that I see in my practice is I have a hybrid practice. So I added my direct primary care component onto my existing practice. So I had a full, full practice full of traditionally insured patients, Medicare patients, Blue Cross, Cigna, uh, and easily 3,000 active patients. And then reaching out to the uh, 
uninsured patients in my community, we added this direct primary care practice onto it, so it was a hybrid in addition to it. So I see people that are paying their own way and people that are paying $1,000 for their insurance uh, at, at the same time. The, the attitude of the patient is completely different. You know, the one person wants absolutely everything done. I'm paying money. I want my MRI. Uh, you know, I want the name brand drug. Whereas the person that's having to be a little bit uh, savvy with their with their money is a very smart consumer. They want to know what everything costs. They want to know, you know, is, would you spend your money on this? Is this an appropriate thing to do? Do we need to get the MRIs? So, completely different things. So, when you're looking at how the healthcare system is now, what we're trying to do, we're trying to to create insurance. So we're gonna take everything that's out there available to you and we're gonna put it in a box and we're gonna call that box health insurance. We're gonna put end of life care, we're gonna put in chemotherapy, we're gonna put in joint replacements, pacemakers, all that has to be included and covered in that box of insurance. And oh, by the way, we're gonna stick primary care in there as well. What that does basically is it, it raises the, the cost of access to primary care by including it without that big ticket stuff. Whereas if you were to go ahead and pull all that stuff aside, just leave the primary care component alone, the primary care costs come crashing down, and there's so much that can be done at the primary care level that we can accomplish a lot of uh, So what this basically does is it separates routine predictable care from a catastrophic, and we heard about that earlier. Uh, you know, so this is a, a working example of that. Uh, you probably can't see this, but this is basically what we include for our membership fee. We, charge, we do an annual exam, up to 25 office visits per year. We don't charge anything for those office visits. Uh, after 25 visits, it's, it's uh, $25 per visit. We've never had anybody come close. That's every other week for a year. Um, and believe it or not, as I was talking about before, people honestly don't like to come to the doctor. As much as people think people always want to come to the doctor, that's the last place they want to be spending their time. So a run on the office is not something that we fear and it's not happening in the limits of 2010. Uh, we include PAP tests for women, we include uh, as indicated PSA <laughs> tests for men, the mammograms included in there, uh, we do screening tests for colon cancer through, through school studies, uh, we include routine blood work in that uh, monthly membership fee, EKGs, cortisone shots, I'll take off skin cancers, do 24 hour heart monitors, uh, also, we also include their flu shots in there as well. We don't raise the price for pre-existing conditions. We don't exclude people for pre-existing conditions. Uh, the only thing we don't do is we don't prescribe chronic controlled substances. Uh, we don't treat chronic pain. And if you guys are familiar with Florida, the state kind of has a reputation of having pill mills. And we don't want to just have the appearance of exchanging cash for drugs. So we just don't even get into that business there. So to give you an idea of some of the savings, what we would typically get for these types of procedures, I would normally charge $150 for a joint injection. Uh, we repair lacerations in the office, about $260 we would normally charge. We don't charge for that. Uh, just last week I had a woman that chopped the tip of her thumb off. She called me up and she said, I'm going to go to the emergency room. I said, go oh, to the emergency room. Come on over here. She would have easily had a several thousand dollar bill in the year uh, that we just sewed her up in the office real quick. I mentioned that we, we partner with some people in the community to get special pricing for our patients that are self-paying patients. It's amazing how much money you can save to leave your insurance card in your pocket sometimes and just pay cash a lot of money. Uh, so CT scans, uh, we can get for about $200. Uh, we can get a colonoscopy for a little over 1000 which sounds like a lot, but uh, Dick, what's your hospital charge for a colonoscopy? $3,200. Uh, chest x-ray about $20, MRIs we can get for $200. <coughs> Don't worry about the details of this, but this is an actual hospital bill of a patient of mine that went to the emergency room for abdominal pain. I'm going to break it down in the next slide, but just to tell you I'm not making these numbers up. This is the photocopy of the bill, so it is what it is. Uh, and if you look at the hospital charge for that visit, it was just under $20,000. If you didn't have health insurance, that would be your bill. So if instead of going there, that patient called us up, we could see them same day in our office. We plan for emergencies. We have those slots built into our schedule. Like in fact, I could probably see them quicker in my office than the week in the emergency room. We can get stacked ZT scans, stacked labs, just like anybody else. We can stuff back real time. They came to us. Their out-of-pocket cost would have been about $278. So what do we charge? for $50 a month. 
double that for, for, for adding a partner. Uh, family four is $25 for the first child, $10 for each additional child. A family four, $435. So if you look at how that looks for a family of four, $135 a month, you're paying more for your cell phone, you're paying more for your cable television. But this is health care for your entire family for less than your cell phone and your, and your, and your television. Uh, versus a standard PPO policy. So you, know, you get a, a, a standard PPO policy would be one like you would get one of these Cadillac plans. It's something that you would not have a high deductible that would cover all these things just like our program covers all the stuff. So uh, the cost of that's $1,900 a month for that family of four. So after a year, the difference between these two, one just to pay for all the care that you need versus one to have coverage and the care, uh, $21,000 difference per year. So let's look at a family of four here. And that, um, the black line, the black line across the bottom there is the cost of a standard in 2014 dollars, actual 2014 plans uh, of a family of four with a high deductible health plan, $6,300 deductible per person, $12,500 per family is the deductible on that. So uh, the cost of that plus our membership fee Okay. So now you've got your high deductible safety net and you have all your care covered in there. And the cost of that over 10 years is just under $100,000, $96,000. That, that red line across the top, you can't see that there, but that is the, the, uh, the standard PPO pricing also over 10 years. And the difference between, or that price is $220,000 over 10 years, so net savings uh, is $135,000. So in the one plan that costs more, you're paying you're paying co-pays, you might have some deductibles, you're still paying for your for your care. The plan on the bottom, all your routine care is covered, you have a safety net, but yes, you have deductibles. So let's just say this is one of the sickest families in the history of the planet, and they're gonna hit about ten thousand dollars deductible every single year. They just they're always in the doctor's office having problems every year for a decade. I saved them $135,000. Take $100,000 off of that, and I still saved them $35,000 by paying for their own health care, so their routine health care services and separating the two. That, that, uh, that Same employer that, that had 10 employees, uh, they decided that they were going to put their patients on that high deductible plan, buy their membership in our program for all their employees uh, over 10 years. That employer would save about $1.3 million. Again, this is the most benevolent employer ever. They have the sickest employees ever. They hit a $10,000 deductible every single year. Uh, that's going to come out of their pocket. We're still going to save them $350,000 over 10 years by separating the two out from one another. <laughs> So how can we do this for so cheap? Well, we buy all this stuff wholesale. We buy it on behalf of our patients. We buy in bulk. So we buy our labs wholesale. We contract with Quest. We contract with LabCorp. We get our imaging for cheap. So my labs that I promised the patient, they would have paid three or four hundred dollars out of pocket for, cost me thirty dollars. Uh, my mammogram, I have a contract to rate of twenty-five dollars for my mammogram. It's normally two to three hundred dollars if you're a self-paying patient. Uh, flu shots cost me six bucks. Path test, I have contracted rate for, with that pathologist for that for just under 30. So, you know, if the patient comes in and they pay for one month and they fall off the face of the earth, I broke even. The rest is basically a profit that covers my office expenses, my staffing, and what I feel like I think is, is fair for me to make at the end of the year. So, uh, the nice thing about this is I, I sweep this money directly out of the patient's uh, checking or savings accounts. I do not send out bills. I don't do any kind of collection. Uh, everything's automatic uh, deduction, and my billing consists of every month we click a button and all the money goes into our account. That's it. Nothing. No statements, no coding, no nothing. So it takes nothing to collect from these patients. So we've heard a lot about the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is, uh, was put in place with the promise of, of providing coverage for 32, 000, or 32 million Americans. Uh, many of those 32 million would be put on to, uh, based upon the Medicaid expansion, so it gives them this coverage without necessarily access to, to care 
or at least gives them access to the emergency room, which is the most expensive place on the planet to get health care, but they have access to that. Uh, and the, the assumption, if everything worked perfectly, if everybody signed up exactly like they do, and all states played ball like they said they would, they assumed 26 million would still be uninsured. The cost for that plan is estimated lately about $1.8 trillion over 10 years. So let's say instead of doing that, we're going to give all 58 million uninsured people a membership-based program. We're going to pay for them all to, to be in this. So now 100% of the people that had no insurance now have access to routine affordable health care. Uh, we're going to cover most of their, their needs. Uh, so now they have care, but they don't necessarily have coverage. Total 10-year cost on that would be $348 billion savings of $1.46 trillion of the Affordable Care Act. So, about five years ago, um, we started doing this in 2010, so about five years ago, I got a call from Dick Armstrong and said, you really need to come to Washington and, and talk to people about what you're doing. Uh, because when we started this, nobody ever heard of anything like this before. And we, we spent almost a year and a half speaking with lawyers and, and accountants and figuring out how we can do this and not get ourselves in trouble and how we can keep ourselves from going bankrupt in the process. Uh, so we came here and the first question out of the audience uh, after we gave the talk, this is all doctors, uh, and we said, you charge you know, $50 a month. Actually, okay, at the time we were charging $80 a month. Uh, she said, you charge $80 a month, what happens if, if Somebody sets up right on your doorstep and charges $40 a month. I said, well, the first question out of the box is, what are you going to do when the cost of health care comes down? I said, I'll take that question because nobody's ever asked that anything to state before. <laughs> 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 I said, but I guess what I'm, what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to compete on price and quality. Uh, I'm going to have to justify why I'm more expensive and provide what the patient sees as a better level of care. Uh, maybe. The, the guy down the street just runs people through like a mill, and somebody's just fine with that. They're happy as long as they're in and out and it's cheaper for them. That might be fine for them. But we put some market forces in place, some actual, you know, this is true paper quality, you know, where the patient sees the value of the services and they, and they reward you for it. You adjust and compensate with what is a true fair market value for, for physician services. So fast forward five years, we now have legislation passed in eight states uh, that clarifies that what we're doing is not health insurance. Uh, so when, when our lunch speaker talked about you know, sort of creative destruction and, and things will start snowballing, uh, things are snowballing. I mean, this is this is getting steam. Uh, practices are popping up all over the country. Uh, uh, you're going to hear tomorrow from, actually you're going to hear the debate tonight, later tonight also from Josh Umber of Atlas MD. He's got an awesome program there. Uh, we're presently working on this in Florida, and I think there are nine states right now in addition that, are, that have uh, pending legislation. Uh, so this is a really exciting time to be doing what we're doing. Uh, we're also doing, seeing some action here at the federal level, uh, working with the uh, with the IRS to clarify the uh, the uh, tax status of, of plans like this to make sure that patients can use health savings account funds, pre-tax dollars to pay for, for memberships and programs like ours. Uh, Medicare beneficiaries might be able to use their, their benefits for membership-based programs like primary care. So this is a, a really exciting time to, to be in primary care. So in a program like this, a primary care doctor can make the same amount of money as a specialist. But seeing a fraction of patients not, work, not working nearly as hard, not working for the insurance company, and not just uh, somebody that's, that's checking boxes and, and clicking off things just to, to satisfy the insurance company requirements, not jumping through hoops. So we're pretty thrilled to be doing what we're doing. So with that, I'm just going to take any questions that you have. Um, how could you compare uh, a typical day for you and your practice um, to direct primary care to someone that works in, say, a hospital setting? So, when you're an employee, who, who employees do, who do you answer to? Uh, you know, so, so when you work, at, you know, as an employee for a hospital, you know, who do you serve? You can't. In my opinion, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve the corporation and 
give you the best perhaps, the needs of the patient at the same time. The two, there's, there's always going to be some conflict in there. Um, I don't have that. Um, you know, if you were to truly see how many people were, were in the exam room uh, with the patient making the healthcare decisions when you have a third party in there, and uh, even better point with the fourth party uh, that we heard about today. Uh, so many people crammed in there that influence that decision, whereas with us, it's, it's two of us making the decision. You know, we as a, as a hired consultant, you as the patient that's going to decide, and as together we decide based upon you know, what's, what's best for you in front of you. Uh, I can tell you that because I do a hybrid program, I'm busy. I mean, my days are busy, uh, and busy is relative. But typically, I would probably see 20 to 25 patients in a day, but our membership based for patients, uh, you know, their initial appointments are 45 minutes to an hour long. Uh, these people are sick as hell. Uh, these people are sick as hell when they first come in to see us. And it's interesting because, you know, one of the things that we that we get accused of is that, well, you're just taking the, the, the healthy people and dumping the sick people on the insurance company. Uh, and the reality of it is is that we're taking care of problems, uh, patients that the insurance companies have ignored for decades. Uh, and have not wanted in their system. And so, you know, the past couple of weeks, I had one patient that came in, hadn't seen the doctor in 15 years, her blood sugar was over 600. Um, you know, I had a 22-year-old girl that was just discharged from the hospital after having diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, she hadn't had insurance, couldn't get insulin. Uh, another patient hadn't been seen in 15 years again, the sugar's 340, 350, just lost 30 pounds, and just, uh, so to be able to take these people and to take them from the brink of disaster and to have them be some of our, our healthiest and best patients in practice, it's so rewarding. It's just a, a wonderful feeling to be able to, to do that when the system's left and behind. So this has been an easy sell for us legislatively. When we go up there and they see the kind of work we're doing, the health department sends us referrals when they can't get patients in there. <laughs> Uh, so I understand that you're primary care, but could any part of your business model be used for more specialized fields? Uh, I think this is perfect for any cognitive field. So rheumatology would be great, endocrinology would be great. You know, people that, uh, that are recurring office visits, you don't have big ticket stuff. Um, we talked to, for somebody before about OBGYN. I think that there's certainly a place for the routine uh, GYN care in there and then perhaps uh, discounted fee set for members that have any sort of procedures done. Uh, uh, one of the neat things is we do work a lot with specialists in our area. So some of the specialists just don't want to be bothered with trying to negotiate contracts with Quest and LabCorp and the imaging center. So we'll have a patient that will see the rheumatologist. The rheumatologist will give them the order for the blood work and the, the x-rays. The patient will bring them by our office. We'll put them on our order and send them off. So an example, one patient would have had her lab bill would have been $1,800 using her high deductible plan under us is about eighty dollars by using our program. Uh, so now she can afford to see the rheumatologist, she can afford to get her lab, she can afford to get her imaging. So we work if we partner with them. This works great for dentistry as well. Uh, so we're working on some programs now where we can you know, have the patient have, have an option of adding on for an extra you know, ten, fifteen dollars a month in that routine dental care on that as well. But lots of opportunities for it. Dermatology. I'm sorry? Dermatology. Dermatology, yeah, I mean and this has been used a lot today, uh, but if you've seen one primary or one direct primary care practice, you've seen one direct primary care practice. Uh, they're all different, you know. So some will be, you know, flat fee for service. Some will be membership based. Uh, dermatology. Uh, Kathleen Brown is uh, doing some great stuff out in uh, you know, Oregon, Oregon, uh, where she's direct pay doesn't take any insurance. So, yeah, it can be done in lots of different specialties. <laughs> Have you run into any instances where um, you know CMS or any like the regulatory authorities in the states have uh, been hostile to what you're doing? Um, I just like the example of the Shoreline Hospital is obviously like when they were put out of business and with one strike of a pen. Um, so is that something that like have you had any specific like run-ins with? Most directly, no. In other states, yes. Uh, New York. Utah and West Virginia all tried to shut down similar practices, basically claiming 
they were operating as an insurance business without the license to do the insurance business. So that's one of the reasons why we've been so aggressive at getting out ahead. I think the hardest thing for me in working with our legislature in Florida is the first question was why do you want to be legislated? Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing keeping you from doing this right now. Nobody said anything to you. Why, why are you here? Why are you getting involved in this? And, and so it goes to, you know, we don't want to, to have that happen just because all it takes is, you know, one insurance company to say, hey, Office of Insurance Regulation, I think you should check these guys out. Maybe we should put a cease and desist order on while we're looking into it. Um, so, we sent a, a blinded test case up to the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation and said, what do you think about a practice or anything like that? They said, hmm, that might look like insurance. So, again, we're, we're thrilled it's flying through our, through our legislature. Uh, we have some great backing behind us, uh, some very, very powerful partners uh, that are supporting us up, up in Tallahassee. So, uh, and again, it's, this is everything that we've done when we've gone up to up to the states has been pushed through on a bipartisan basis. So with a bipartisan bill written on a written out of committee uh, as opposed to a single individual legislator proposing it. Uh, and so when it comes out as a bipartisan bill, it'll certainly pass. So no, directly we've not had any threat. I had a cool question. You mentioned about uh, patients with pre-existing conditions and chronic conditions coming. Um, how does uh, patients in this type of plan uh, get covered for like pharmaceuticals and other things that you may not have a managed contract with? Or do you have those uh, contracts with companies to kind of reimburse or lower costs on the medicines that they may be taking for these conditions? Yeah, a couple, couple ways to deal with that. Um, <coughs> There's a great app, if you're not familiar with it, it's called GoodRx, G-O-O-D-R-X. Uh, it's amazing how much money you can save on, on generic prescriptions with that. $150 prescriptions will come down to $15. Uh, the patient assistance programs, we're talking about some pretty poor people we're taking care of. And so most of them will qualify for, you need something pretty expensive, they'll, they'll qualify for free drugs under a patient assistance program. Uh, a lot of these people will have insurance as well in addition to us, so we try to encourage them to have some kind of to pull off their insurance cards for that, but uh, we try to, to be smart with the medications we choose. I'll probably take two more, and we're, we're running really late here, so, aren't we? Well, you, got, you got time for two more, and okay. then we'll, yeah. I'm just curious, a little bit more about the, um, the employer customers that you have. Yeah. Um, you mentioned one of the, 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 the 10, uh, 10 employees. Do you have uh, do you have bigger ones? Do you also have uh, ones where employers uh, offer your um, your package uh, next to another one, and then you know, uh, their employees you know, some can decide one or the other? Or yeah, we we've really targeted the small businesses uh, under 50 employees. And the we've pretty much gone after uh, because number one, they don't fall under the new employer mandate to purchase insurance from their employees. Uh, where I am, it's a it's a we don't have any employers really over 50 employees, so we target the feeding air conditioning companies, the real estate places, the, the dog groomers. Uh, so a lot of, we have a lot of very small businesses that, that are included in. We don't have any large corporations that have said, you can choose this or that. Uh, Josh Umber is going to be talking to you guys tomorrow. He does a lot of that stuff. So we'll be able to give you more information about, about that. It, it's tricky when you work with, with a business because it starts invoking a lot of other rules. So once you sign up, once an employer sponsors a plan, um, it changes everything about the relationship. It becomes a formal group health plan under federal law. Um, you're required to follow COBRA requirements and, and notifications. So you got to be really careful of how you structure those arrangements to make sure you're not getting yourself into in over your head. Okay. So that's why we spent a year and a half making sure we're doing that properly. So going right to an individual. Piece of cake, you can do it tomorrow. It's any practice can do it. Signing up with employers, you definitely want help with that one. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.